Okay, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. This is the COS Communication Server Technical Update. This is Sam Reynolds. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mike Fitzpatrick, and we're both uh, architects for the COS Communication Server Organization. So as we get started here, this is the agenda for today. We have a fair amount of material to cover here, so I'm not gonna uh, waste your time by reading through these bullets. Um, I'm gonna start and talk about network security enhancements, then Mike is gonna take over and take us through a few items, and then I'll uh, finish up with the remaining items. So um, should be a good amount of material. Let's just go ahead and get right in it. Here's the usual disclaimer chart, and a lot of times this, this disclaimer doesn't mean a whole lot, but in this case, I should remind you, we are talking about stuff that hasn't been delivered yet. Now, there's a number of things that I will talk about that have been delivered through continuous delivery. They're available today, and certainly, you know, those are all safe. But for the items that are truly 3.1 content, we're still a few months from general availability. So something, some things could change. Is that very likely at this point? No, but it could happen. So we do have to put the disclaimer here, and I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this material. So we're gonna start with a set of network security enhancements. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is related to a function called FTP Server JES Access Control. Now, most of you, and quite possibly all of you, use the ZOS FTP server. And um, our FTP server has a rather unique capability uh, for remote job entry to ZOS. I don't know how many of you use it. I do know we have a number of customers that do use it. This function capability has been around for many, many years. It, again, it's a little bit different. Um, we all are familiar with how you do puts and gets to an FTP server to put or get a, a file or do a DIR to list files. With our server, you can request something called JES access mode, file type equal JES. And if you do that and you get put in that mode, when you put something, you're not putting a file, you're putting a job. You do a get, you're retrieving job output. You do a dir, you're listing job status. So this is a fairly interesting capability and a number of um, people out there I do know use it. And as you see down there, we do give you some control of it. There's something called JES interface level, which is an FTP parameter uh, that um, decides whether your access to jobs will only be your user ID plus one character or if it's a broader. There's also filtering and access based on SAP interfaces, and there's a number of filters you can use. If you've never used this before, this is kind of what it looks like. You know, from my FTP client type site, file type equal JES. That's, I'm telling the FTP server I want to change into JES mode. And when I do that, if I do a DIR, instead of seeing a list of um, files, what I'm seeing is job, a, a list of jobs that are running in their completion status. So what's the problem? Sounds like a kind of a cool function, and it is. Maybe it interests you, maybe it doesn't. Um, what's our issue here? Well, some security experts have expressed concern over this interface, and we can go back several years. There was a man named Phil Young who did a keynote at SHARE, and at that keynote, he talked about a number of things, but in, in, somewhere down in there, he mentioned this capability, and he was saying maybe this is something that could, should concern you. Maybe it's a potential security hole that you need to close up. Um, whether that's, that's the case or not is debatable, but he's, he certainly pointed out, and we started having a lot of customers questioning, uh, questioning some of this. Now, there are SAF classes that you can use to help lock this down, and these are things you should be using anyway. Um, we provide FTP server security access. We provide a set of them, and a couple of them are listed there. Uh, in particular, that first one, FT, FT check JS, or actually the second one, FT check command, that's our FTP command access. It gets driven every time a command comes into the FTP server. So you could write exit code that intercepts the command and says, is the command file type equal JS? Are you trying to get into JES mode? And if so, reject it. Boom, you've completely turned off access to JES mode. The problem with that is it requires you to write exit code. And most of you don't seem to want to do that these days, and we understand that. The other aspect of it is that's a very all or nothing solution. It doesn't give you any granularity if you want to allow access for some people but not others. Um, doing that within the exit obviously ups the complexity of the code quite a bit. So, our customers have been requesting a simpler way to disable file typical JS or limit the number of users who can get to it. 
And you see on the uh, chart there an RFP number, which of course is now an idea that was submitted, and over time got 54 votes. And to put that in perspective, that made it the second highest um, vote getter out of any comm server idea or RFP. So it's something we were definitely paying attention to we wanted to address. And we did it in 3.1 as part of 3.1 development. We provided a serve-off class resource to control the user access to FTP JES mode. And you see that um, staff resource there, ezb.ftp.sysname.ftpdemonname.access.jes. If you have permission to this resource, then you can enter JES mode. If you don't, then you get that 200 message there that says user username is not allowed to use file type equal JES. Now, we don't intend this to be a replacement for JES jobs and JES pool classes. You should still use those. They have broader uh, um, interpretation to um, job control beyond what you get with FTP. But we do strongly recommend, that once you have this, that you do implement this um, SAF resource and you deny access in general and only permit users that need access to file type equal JES mode. Now, as I said, this was developed in 3.1. It was a 3.1. However, once we finished developing it, we did roll it back to ZOS V2R3, V2R4, and V2R5. And that rollback occurred actually a little over a year ago. So this has been out a while now. So if this is something that interests you, um, then you can, get, you can have it now. And if you're not interested, well, maybe you should think about that or what, what, whether you should be interested, because it is our recommendation, again, that once you have this maintenance, that you do implement this resource and try to control access to JES mode. Now, the next topic is a topic that probably sounds familiar if you've seen these presentations in the past. Application Transparent TLS was a function we shipped way back in ZOS V1R7. We believe that most of our customers now use it, and since we've shipped it, almost every release, and maybe every release, has had the, the line item that you see here, ATTLS currency with system SSL. Basically, that's saying that in this release, system SSL has made some changes, and we need to expose access to those changes through policy. And so we we're saying current changes for system SSL, in other words. So what does that mean for 3.1? Well, in 3.1, System SSL provided support for X25519 and X448 elliptic curves for key exchange for TLS version 1, 1.1, and 1.2. They also provided an option to limit the TLS server's allowable elliptic curves. Since they do that, then it is an imperative that we, that we expose that function through ATTLS configuration parameters. So this looks like the same chart almost, We're basically it's saying that same capability is now there for you to configure through ATTLS. You can configure the use of the, those new list curves. You can um, configure the curve list to be used for key exchange negotiation. Like I said about the previous function, this was a 3.1 function from a development perspective. However, once we got it completed, we did roll it back. In this case, it's only rolled back to 2.5, um, and that rollback occurred um, about a little under a year ago, think of the third quarter of last year. And you'll need several pieces of maintenance to use it. You'll need APARs for comm server, for system SSL, and also for the network configuration system, assuming you're using that to configure your policy, and hopefully most of you are. Now, that was one thing that system SSL, system SSL did in 3.1. The other thing they did was support for Cisplex session ticket caching. Now, up through TLS 1.2, we've system SSL supported session resumption through Cisplex wide session ID caches. But TLS 1.3 changed the approach for that and now uses the concept of session tickets, which um, basically the client caches a one time use second session tickets was returned to the server. The server then can use that to perform an abbreviated handshake. Now, ATTLS has supported TLS version 1.3 since V2R4, so we've had that support for a while, and that included session resumption using session tickets, but only within a single application address space. There was no Sysplex-wide support, and of course, there was none from Sysplex SSL, which is why ATTLS couldn't support it. That changes, and um, SSL has added Sysplex-wide support for TLS version 1.3 session tickets, ATTLS now exposes that through ATTLS 
configuration parameters. And you see a couple of parameters uh, there that you configure if, if you're using this function. Um, you use those parameters directly in policy, or more likely you're doing this through network configuration assistance, which supports this configura these configuration parameters as well. And also it notes the GSK server task must be started for all systems in the Sysplex require TLS session resumption. And the third thing that we're going to talk about in this area of um, network security updates revolves around the ZERT network analyzer and its enhanced update support. Now, some of you probably go to share, so you've probably seen the chart right here, oh, it's six, eight, ten times, right? Because we've been talking about ZERT a long time. I won't belabor every point in this chart, but, but what it's basically saying is that ZOS provides four mechanisms to cryptographically protect TCP IP traffic. And those mechanisms all have their own unique and different ways uh, to be configured. And which ones does your shop use amongst these? Well, you maybe use several of them, maybe use all of them. If you have Java applications, there's, you know, you're using the Java Secure Sockets extension, so you're on path number one over there. I just made the comment a minute ago that I think most of you guys probably use ATTLS. So for applications that are using ATTLS, you're on path two. Many of you have SNA applications. And if you have SNI applications, you're probably using Enterprise Extender these days. Well, EE is UDP-based, and to protect it, TLS is not an option. IPsec is the only game in town. So assuming you're encrypting your SNI traffic, which you know, I would hope you are, you're on path three. Some of you may have a um, security mandate that says your file transfers must all be secured with SFTP which is a function under OpenSSH. That's to be contrasted with FTPS, which is our ZOS FTP secured by TLS, typically ATTLS. And so some co companies do have mandates that they prefer SFTP to FTPS. So in that case, you're using path four. So again, I think it's quite possible that many of you are using three or even all four of these paths. Well, that could be complex. If that's the case, and given that these paths have different um, configuration and auditing mechanisms, how do you know you got it right? How do you know that you've done all this configuration correctly and that the traffic you're trying to protect is being protected and it's being protected with the security protocols and versions and key links that your security officer mandates? Uh, and if you're sure you got it right, do you have the ammunition to prove that to auditors and so forth? That problem is why we introduced something called ZOS Encryption Readiness Technology, or ZERT. And we introduced this, introduced this way back in 2.3. So that's about half a dozen years ago now. So this has been out there a while now. We think a lot of our customers are, are using this as well. The initial implementation of it was something called ZERT Discovery, which is SMF 119 subtype 11. We call them ZERT Connection Detail Records. And these records describe the complete cryptographic protection history of every TCP connection and every EE connection. And we write one of those records for every connection, actually at least one for every connection. So you can see that that can end up being a lot of SMF data. So about six months after we shipped that, we shipped the second capability called ZERT aggregation, which provided for SMF 119, 119 subtype 12 ZERT summary records. And these records describe the repeated use of security sessions over time. So now instead of one SMF record or more per connection, you get a summary record for an SMF recording interval for all security sessions. And those security sessions have multiple connections mapping to them. So that way you can greatly reduce the volume of SMF data that has to be stored and processed later. So that was kind of part one and part two of the ZERP story. Part three came around because we wanted to provide you a tool to consume that SMS data and, provide, and do something useful with it. The vendor community has certainly stepped up to the challenge here, and there are a lot of tools out there that consume ZERT data and can generate reports and such around it. But we wanted our own. So back in two, the 2-4 time frame, and we actually rolled it back to 2-3, we produced a tool called the ZOS I mean, the ZERT Network Analyzer, or ZNA. And what ZNA does is it consumes the SMF type 119 subtype 12, the ZERT summary records. It consumes those, and it, and it is a plugin that runs on top of ZOSMF. And it allows you to issue queries 
against all that data and generate reports. So you can do something like ask to ask to see all of the um, TCP connections that you have that are encrypted, but they're encrypted at a level of TLS less than TLS 1.2. You can build any kind of query along those lines, and then you'll get a report back that shows you what that is, and that helps you understand how effectively um, you're meeting your security po uh, needed security posture. Now, the one thing I will also point out is in the center of this picture, toward the top, is the fact that ZNA does prereq DB2 for ZOS version 11 or, or later. So just be aware of that if you've not yet looked at ZNA and, and you're interested in it. It's a very powerful capability and something you may want to consider. So what's happening in 3.1? Well, again, ZNA has been around a while. It's got a lot of capability, but one thing that was a little bit difficult was upgrading to a new release. So when you went to 2.5, you had to manually copy your database connection settings and your application settings from the previous release to 2.5. You had to create a new ZERP network analyzer database instead of reusing an old one. So these were migration steps that had to happen at every release upgrade. And of course, we prefer to not force you down into complicated migration or upgrade actions. In this case, we really were. So beginning in 3.1, we try to make that process either, easier. Now there's a panel that comes up that allows you to reset or import ZNA application settings from a prior release. Again, you used to have to copy the settings over. Now this panel comes, in, comes up and shows you the previous release settings and asks you if you want to copy them over to the new release. Similarly, there's a, a panel that comes up to help you import ZNA database connection settings from a prior release, again, instead of manually copying them. And lastly, there's new DDL templates to facilitate migrating ZERT network analyzers database to a current schema level. So we hope that if you're a ZNA user today on 2.4 or 2.5, and you, when you upgrade to 3.1, you're going to find that process much simpler than it was in the previous releases. And lastly, this is um, sort of a, just a summary about ZERT technology in general. At the top, it points out something we're not really going to talk about here because it was a function delivered back in 2.5, but that CERT policy-based enforcement, very, very powerful capability um, that if you're not aware of, you really should take a look at. It's, it's, it's very good stuff here. And how would you do that? Well, the most important thing on this chart is at the very bottom, and that's that things you should know about CERT link. And when you get the PDF, that's a link you can click on, and it takes you to a page that has a wealth of information about CERT blog entries, videos, documentation, and so you can find out all you need to know or, or more, than, more than you now know now if you're already using ZERT. So I'm highly recommended to take a look at that. And with that, um, that's the end of our network security section. I'm going to pass the baton over to Mike, and he's going to start you off by talking about SysLogD support for secure logging over TCP. All right. Thanks, Sam. Uh, go to the next chart. So what is SysLogD? Uh, most of you should be familiar with it and use it. Uh, for those who are not, it's essentially just a process that runs inside the ZOS Unix environment. And specifically, it's used for ZOS Unix applications for logging, you know, messages, either, you know, event types of messages, warning, errors. Even some, you know, components or applications use it to actually capture debug information that these applications, and if you need to, you know, create, you know, diagnostic information, et cetera. And these are all, and so it's typical applications, for example, our FTP server is a heavy user of SysLogD for recording information. OpenSSH and other uh, ZOS Unix applications will use SysLogD. And how SysLogD is controlled or managed is all done by defining rules in a configuration file. And the default location for that file is slash etc slash syslog.conf. So some of the rules that you create here, um, for example, you will define rules on how the messages are going to be received by syslogd. So there's multiple ways they can be received by a syslogd running on your system. One of them is that the local applications that are running inside the ZOS Unix, um, uh, as a ZOS Unix application, they can write to syslog directory directly using the syslog API call. You can also do rules in syslog the configuration, 
specify the list of remote hosts that you want permitted to send messages and debug information to you. You might wonder well, why, you know, some of you might be doing this, but part of the reason behind this is every, you know, if you're, especially in a Sysplex environment, or if you have other things running, application tiers running on other platforms, you may want to consolidate all the messages for these workloads in one place. By default, everything goes to its own local copy of syslog, which means that you would have to then capture syslog files from a multitude of locations just to probably track an end-to-end -end flow of, an, of, a, of your workload. So what this syslog allows, and this again, not just on ZOS, but on other platforms as well, is the ability to configure it to say, I want to be the consolidator of all syslog messages. So you can, few rules list the number of, you know, the remote hosts that you're going to allow to send connections to, or send messages to you. And then you will be able to um, uh, do, you know, based on other rules, handle those messages. So now you have rules that basically say what can be received by syslogd. Now you also then have rules that say when I receive these messages, either locally from my local applications or from remote hosts, what can I do with these messages? Well, you have rules to basically say, depending on the message type or the application type, you can send them to in, you know, individual files. So you can split up, for example, your open SSH messages from your FTPD messages. Or you can take, you know, depending on the type of message or the severity of the messages, you may want to record an SMF record. And we record an SMF record type 109 that records the information from that syslog D message. Or you may be one that you don't, you're not, uh, um, this syslog D instance is not the one that's consolidating everything. And there may be another remote place that is consolidating. So you would configure to say, for these types of messages, I want to ship them to another syslog D running somewhere else in my environment. So just kind of pictorially, how does this work? So for example, here we have a ZOS host and we have a set of local applications running and we have syslog D running. So, if you, so what, how this happens then is they use this um, syslog API call and under the coverage, essentially what it is, is it's using an AF Unix socket to talk directly to the syslog D daemon and then it determines what it needs to do with those messages. Additionally, you could have a set of remote hosts. These do not necessarily have to just be ZOS remote hosts. They can be any type of platform remote host that has syslog D. They could be configured to send messages to the syslog D running on the ZOS host depicted here by number one. By on ZOS though, right now today, syslog D, use, it requires UDP to be able to send those messages over. Now, in addition, on that ZOS host, you could configure syslog D to say, I want a subset of the messages that I receive, either locally or from remote, I could ship them to another location as well. And again, that remote destination does not have to be ZOS. It could be ZOS or another platform. But again, with the ZOS implementation of syslog D, it does require a UDP connection to be sent over, to, to be able to send the messages over. So as you're all familiar, aware, UDP is unreliable. Now, you know, the majority of the time, the messages are going to be delivered, but there is a, ch a chance, slight, it may be slight, but there may be a chance that the messages that are being sent re to remote host or being received from remote host will get lost because UDP, again, is unreliable. In addition to that, it is, um, you can't use TLS to secure these messages, you know, the, the connections. UDP is like Enterprise Extender, where what you're going to need to secure it is you're going to have to set up some uh, virtual private network or IPsec tunnels in order to be able to secure the messages being flowed from a syslog D remote to a syslog D local. All right, so what we did new in 3.1 is basically now we have new rules in syslog D. So when you say you want to either receive messages from remote hosts or you want to send messages to remote hosts, you have the option to say the default is UDP, like it is, you know, prior to 3.1, but you have the ability to say, I want to use TCP instead. And what will happen in that case is the syslog D 
um, on ZOS will set up a listener and will be able to accept connections from a list of remote hosts that you have configured in your syslog D rules. In addition, you can set a set of destinations you want to be able to send messages to and syslog D on ZOS will send up TCP connections to connect to those remote partners. And the remote partners obviously will have to have been configured to accept messages over TCP as well. Now, because we're using TCP, we also can have additional rules in your syslog D config that says, um, I want to be able to secure these through TLS. And what will happen then is we can use TLS policy, ATTLS policies to secure the messages that are being sent or received from remote hosts. Okay. So that's for the, the syslog D enhancement. What we're going to talk about now is networking support for ZOS containers. And if you go to the next chart, just another disclaimer on top of the one that Sam originally had, this is not a 3.1 GA deliverable. This is a post 3.1 deliverable. We did have a statement of direction a couple of years ago describing this, but um, it is going to be something that is post GA. So definitely all the content here is subject to change. But what we wanted to talk about here is just give you a background on ZOS containers and specifically how, it apply, uh, how uh, the networking changes are going to be um, implemented to support this. So just giving you a background on the um, application develop, uh, deployment evolution, way back when it used to be you have one giant um, system with a host operating system and then you had a whole set of applications running inside of it. Now, the issue with that is obviously there's very little isolation between those applications. So a rogue application could affect all the other applications running on that OS. So then we came up with virtualized servers, which basically said, let's carve that big giant machine. And, and we, you know, obviously we've had that for years with LPAR, but essentially what it says is now instead of having one large host operating system with a bunch of applications, let's split them up into different virtualized servers or virtual machines and run a subset of applications on each one of them. So that does provide some additional isolation, but it is it does basically require an entire operating system to be built and started on top of hypervisor. So then they came up with something called containers. And that's been around for a while, but it kind of became revolutionized when Docker basically made it a lot easier to, to create them and to be able to run them. And essentially what a container is, is you have that single host operating system now, but rather than having a, a, the, 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 you know, a heavyweight virtual machine that needs to be started, these are very lightweight um, instances that can immediately get started and you still get a lot of the, the same isolation features that you would with a virtual machine and a hypervisor. So everything that's running in the container from a networking standpoint, from a process standpoint, from a file system standpoint, all of that is isolated with every other container in, that's running in that image and that ZOS, I mean, in that host, as well as it is isolated from anything else running natively on that host, which is important when we start talking about ZOS containers. All right, so from the previous picture, as you can see, containers are, are you know, are very good and they're very, they're very good for microservices, et cetera. And so what happens in a containerized environment, essentially what you're doing is you're running lots of different groupings of containers. So you may have a set of four or five containers that provide one service, another set of containers that provide a different service. And over time, that can grow into a lot of containers running over a lot of different systems and trying to manage making sure all instances are up and running on all lo lo possible locations. Managing that became, you know, had became a nightmare. So then several companies, you know, started working on orchestration uh, of these containers. And the one that kind of came out as becoming the de facto standard is Kubernetes from Google, which is an open source implementation of a container orchestration. And essentially what I want to talk about here is because when we start talking about ZOS containers, we'll actually be able, we're actually not only supporting the starting and stopping of containers, but the orchestration through Kubernetes as well. So for those that may not be familiar with it, is that uh, quick definitions, 
is from a Kubernetes, um, what that is, is basically it's an orchestration um, to be able to automate deploying or scaling or manager, managing all of the containerized applications that you want to run. And so what happens is that these applications that make up a service, for example, can be grouped logically together in Kubernetes and scheduled and managed as a logical unit. Now, this unit is, um, is not called a container in Kubernetes, it's called a pod, which can consist of one or more containers running inside of it. But that's the smallest unit, so when you hear pods, they're kind of interchangeably interchangeable with a container, but the real official terminology is called a pod in Kubernetes. Now, where these pods run, these are called nodes, and these can be either virtual machines or actual physical servers where the pods can be uh, scheduled. And there's two different types of nodes, and this is again important when, we're, when we start talking about ZOS containers. There's something called a control plane node, which basically is, as you can see, it's the brains behind the Kubernetes cluster. It essentially um, manages and controls the entire Kubernetes system. It runs a set of components directly on that node that manages and keeps track of the state information of what's going on in the Kubernetes cluster. The other type of node is a worker node, and that's really where the, the bulk of the work is done. You have the control plane node, which is Kubernetes specific information to manage things, and then you have the worker nodes that are actually doing the work. That's where you actually, when you deploy your services or your microservices, that's where they will run is on these worker nodes. And then the cluster is essentially the collection of a control, one or more control plane nodes and one or more worker nodes. And this is just an example of how it will be looking on, ZO, on, on ZOS. For the control plane node, well, actually, let me start going to the right. On the worker nodes for ZOS, there's specific Kubernetes components. There's this cryo, which is a container runtime, and there's a kubelet, which is a Kubernetes component. Those are being ported directly to run natively on ZOS. Those are actually just um, started tasks that are going to be running, and the, they'll be able to um, kubelet is basically how it communicate, how a worker node communicates with the control plane node, and cryo is a container runtime to be able to actually deploy and stop container images. There's also a ZOS CNI. I won't get into too much detail there right now, but I'll get into a little bit more. But Kubernetes has a concept of a, of a network, its, its own network to provide this isolation. So we're playing in that as well by actually creating our own connection network interface or container network interface. And then you'll see here there's going to be a set of pods that are going to be able to run on ZOS as well. And we'll go into a little more detail exactly what those pods are. Now on the left is something different. This is the control plane appliance, or control plane node. And as you know, see, there's a whole set of different um, Kubernetes components that can run in the control plane node. We did not want to try to port all of those directly to run natively on ZOS, because a lot of those things rely on, they were all built initially for Linux, and so they have a lot of dependencies on functions that are only available in like a Linux networking stack or in a Linux kernel. So rather than try to reinvent the whole wheel, what we decided to do is we are created what we call like a ZOS control plane. This is based on the same technology that Z, you, you, if you're familiar with ZOS containers extensions or Z, ZCX, where what will happen is we are actually creating a Linux address, a, a Linux operating system running inside of a ZOS. And what we are doing is providing all the components that will make up a control plane node in Kubernetes. So what that means then now is that you'll have a complete Kubernetes cluster on ZOS. You don't need any other, uh, any other platform or any other um, to be able to run nodes to be able to manage this. So everything will be running directly on ZOS, either as a ZO, you know, within a ZOS system that a worker node is, or running within an address space on ZOS, which is our control plane node. So you may ask, well, don't I already have all this containerized stuff? And hopefully this next chart will kind of explain where we're positioning compared to the other different containers we have out there. Well, the first one is the Linux on Z systems. That's your, you know, you have your Linux on Z system LPAR, 
And you can run, you know, anything you can run on any other distributed Linux, you can run inside of a Linux on Z system Melpar. So you can run containers, you can run, um, you know, build container images that are S 390 X specific that will run on Linux on Z systems. We also have um, next is containers extensions in that ZCX. Very similar to Linux on Z systems containers. So if you build a container and you run it on Linux on Z system, you can run it on ZCX unchanged. Essentially what it is though, instead of having a Linux on Z system LPAR, you just have an address space where you are running ZCX and then you can actually use Docker to deploy that S390X image directly into the, the, the Linux operating system that's running inside of ZCX. So how is that different then from ZOS containers? Well, the first two sets that I just talked about, those are Linux-based containers. Those are based on Linux architecture. So you cannot run a Linux on Z image natively on ZOS. You have to run it inside of a Linux environment. What ZOS containers is gonna do is provide the ability to um, allow you to containerize applications that you currently are able to run natively and run them as a containerized application. Initially, mm -hmm. what we're gonna support in the initial release will be things that are ZOS Unix specific. So anything like you know, a WebSphere, a ZOS Unix application like Node.js or a Go or Python or you know, ZOS Connect, that's gonna be our first iteration of what we're gonna be containerizing. Eventually, what we're going to be able to do is containerize subsystems as well. For example, Kix or IMS. Now, the key thing again here: these are not these are really ZOS specific applications. It's just that we're able to run them in a containerized environment. So, all the tools and things that you're used to are familiar with in deploying things on other platforms. You'll be able to do the exact same things on ZOS. So, these container images. These are, there, there's an open container initiative a standard or OCI standard that basically says, how is a container created and how is it run? We follow those standards to the, to the letter for running these containers and building them on ZOS and running them on ZOS. So having said that, how does ZOS containers networking work? Well, there's, three diff there's a couple of different components of, of uh, networking that are done in Kubernetes. Well, the first one is this control plane node. This is where we're running our appliance. Our appliance is running and we can run the control plane node directly in it. It needs an IP address because that's, an, from a Kubernetes standpoint, that's a node and it needs to be able to be IP address accessible. So if you, um, what we are creating is a new Viper range statement that is specific for ZCPA, which stands for ZOS control plane appliance. And essentially what that says, it's a, a single, it's not a range, it's a single IP address and it says this IP address in this case here is for the exclusive use of a ZOS control plane appliance. It is not available to be used by any other ZOS applications or anyone else or even ZCX. It is exclusively for use for any appliance that starts up as a ZOS control plane appliance. So now that IP address is gonna be accessible any other system so that the worker nodes are able to communicate with the control plane node using that IP address that was defined in that statement. On the worker nodes themselves, there's going to be a set of pods running. Each pod, as you know, which is under the covers, is just container. A container, when it gets started, has an IP address associated with it so that you can actually reach it. Kubernetes creates what's called a private network when it's doing its um, um, creating its cluster. We're not able to support a private network out of the box because, again, it relies on a lot of Linux internals to be able to support NATing and um, virtualization. So rather than do that, what we've dis what we're doing here is we're creating another Viper Ring mm -hmm. statement, and this is actually a subnet. This is you basically carve out a subnet on each of your ZOS worker nodes of available IP addresses. So when containers get started by Kubernetes, or we are also porting not only Cryo, we're porting Podman as well, which is another container type of uh, runtime. When you start a pod, either through Kubernetes or through Pod, essentially what happens is it will, uh, 
it will reach out and find an IP and we, uh, come to our networking stack and we will return one of these IP addresses in the range that you've configured here and return it to the pod. Hmm. These are Question. ephemeral IP addresses, meaning that when pod one on the left here gets restarted, it could get an entirely different IP address. But that's the way pods in Kubernetes work. These IP addresses are ephemeral. They're only valid for the life of that pod. When that pod goes down, that IP address gets returned. Now, as part of this, those IP addresses, again, are the exclusive use of these pods. So on the example on the left, that IP address 10.10.21.1, pod one there is the only one who has access to it. No other pod can bind to it. No other native application running directly on ZOS are able to bind to it. That pod has complete isolation from a networking standpoint because all it knows about and all it can use is that one IP address as its, as its source. Question. All the other IP addresses are unavailable to it. So we'll do a lot more deep dive on, um, so stay tuned for future uh, CAP education session. Once we're, uh, we um, you know, generally announce the availability of ZOS containers, we'll be back to give you a lot more detail because there's a lot of networking specific stuff I've kind of glossed over. This is just trying to give you a taste of this, but uh, we will uh, come back to you with more, definitely more detail on this. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about before passing back over to Sam is communication server support for uh, Rocky Express 3. And so again, similar to what we talked about um, some, uh, with some other technologies, Hopefully you are familiar with this. We've had come, uh, you know, shared this with you several different times. But for you, those of you who are not, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on it. But shared communications over RDMA is our implementation of being able to use RDMA. And RDMA is remote direct memory access. And what this does, it essentially allows the, the RNIC, which is basically a network interface card for RDMA, to reach into host memory to receive read data and then send it to another um, interface um, any distance away and directly write that into the host. So what it does is it eliminates having to go through a TCP protocol stack. It eliminates the need to actually move the data into the um, interface itself. You basically just point to a piece of memory and say, you know, the interface read directly from the host memory and store directly into host memory. Now, the issue with this is that it isn't TCP protocol. It is a different protocol. It's an RDMA protocol. So to really take advantage of this, you would have to basically write your application to use this different type of uh, socket interface. What we've done with shared memory communications is we've made this transparent. Essentially, you can continue to use your socket applications, but under the covers, we're gonna make the determination whether it makes sense to go to RDMA or whether we would use TCP. So how this transition works is your application still does its normal TCP connection establishment. So it's doing the three-way handshake, but as part of that handshake, both sides determine, are we RDMA capable? Which means that, are we able to use RDMA protocol instead of TCP protocol to transfer traffic back and forth? If both sides agree that they can do RDMA, under the covers, even though your sockets are still just doing TCP socket send receives, under the coverage, we're transforming that into actual RDMA calls and using the RDMA adapter to actually send the messages across the, the network. So what this does, it provides you know, improved performance as you know, from terms of throughput and latency, but it also provides you know, significant CPU savings because we're not having to go through the protocols the TCP protocol stack, we can directly have the, um, the, the device, the RNIC, read directly from memory. So that is, you know, so that's kind of the uh, advantages of it. One of the drawbacks initially, this was our first initial release, which was SMC, what we call it version one. What it required though, is both endpoints had to be on the same subnet. You could not have any type of routing across for RDMA. What we've introduced in 3.1 and rolled back to V2R5 is something what we call Routable Rocky or SMC RV2. And what version two does, it allows you to have the different endpoints on different subnets. 
which allows you then to be able to route over longer distances. That was one of the drawbacks with the original version one, is you really were limited because you had to be on the same layer two network. So now what happens is that you can actually go over routers to reach your end, your, your end point. And one of the key things and how that's done is under the coverage for Radabo Rocky, what the, the, the device does is it actually converts the, encapsulates a packet as a UDP packet and it uses this well-known port. So if you have any firewalls in between them, you need to open it to be able to allow that port of uh, UDP traffic to flow between the two endpoints. But essentially what that does now is it allows you to kind of have more use cases for RDMA. And where it really starts shining this SMCR technology is really when you have these long-lived streaming connections. So for example, if you have like software replication going on all the time or other types of streaming type of workloads that are continuously streaming, this is where you can really have significant benefit by adopting the SMCR technology because it will actually, you know, significantly improve your throughput and response times as well as reduce the amount of CPU needed to be able to move that data. So as part of this, we also have a new RDMA RNIC card or called Rocky Express 3. It's essentially just a technology refresh, so there's, you know, uh, you know faster processors, et cetera. It is a dual port on both the 10 gig and the 25 gig so that you can actually have um, multiple IP, you know, multiple um, connections to it. It can be shared similar to our other uh, Rocky offerings. It can be shared across multiple LPARs like, you know, OSIS DAR as well today. It does support both Rocky version one and Rocky version two, which is the routable Rocky. We obviously recommend everybody move to Rocky version two because it does provide this routable Rocky feature. Okay. All right, so continuing, the next topic here is communication server exploitation of the IBM function registry for ZOS, which I think is the longest title in the presentation. So having that out of the way, some of you have probably heard of the function registry. Some may have not. It's been around since 2.3 uh, is when it was initially shipped. But in 3.1, communication server becomes the first ZOS element to actually exploit it. But prior to this, I think some vendors exploited it, but none of the um, ZOS elements had yet. And the idea was that you would um, register functions with the registry and could track usage of functions, which could be useful for a, a number of reasons. In 3.1, communication server makes usage statistics about customer SNA applications and sessions available in the function registry. And this is to help customers better understand their SNA application usage. I've talked to a lot of customers about SNA over the years, and um, especially these days, I find they don't necessarily always have a good handle on the, the question of how much SNA do I really have? You know, as we go forward in time, I think at the management level, sometimes people say, well, SNA is an older protocol, um, do we still use it? And the answer for most of you is absolutely you use it. And so sometimes it's nice to be able to quantify that. How many SNA applications do you actually have? You may not know. How many sessions do you have at like peak load times or what that are, that are SNA sessions? You may not know. And this is designed to help you understand that. So we're going to track some high watermarks for the number of SNA ACBs that are open as well as the number of session counts. Um, we will update the function registry every five minutes to, with that data, and hopefully that provides you some additional insight into what's going on from a SNA perspective. How do you get to the data? Well, ZOS provides you a couple of mechanisms. There's something called a display FXE command. Pretty, um, you don't get a lot of information out of that. What you really want to use is this FXE print utility, and I'm going to show some examples of that on the next two charts. Now, this is another one of those 3.1 functions. It was developed in 3.1, but we did roll it back. We rolled it back to 2.4 and 2.5. Uh, there's a couple of eight parts you need. You see them there. And this was rolled back in the fourth quarter of the past year. So it's been out there a few months now. So here's some sample output from the FXE print utility. And this first chart uh, showing the beginning of the output is basically just some output, some information about which slot we're using, which you don't really care about. Um, when we last updated counters and so forth. The next chart is going to show you the real meat of the information, what you do want to know, which is the fact that we're going to give you some general SNA information. 
As you look down through there, you see that we're telling you the maximum number of RAPI applications, that's LU2, Record API applications, uh, maximum number of ATPC applications, LU6.2, maximum number of TSO apps, maximum number of TN37 applications. All that's interesting, but probably even more interesting is the next set, which is the same um, types of information, but about sessions. How many RAPI sessions do you have? How many APPC sessions? How many TSO sessions? How many TN3270 sessions? So the beauty of all this is once you put on that maintenance or you get to 3.1, we're capturing this in the registry. And if you want to find out, all you have to do is to issue this uh, FXC print utility and you'll see this. And you may get some surprises, may, either direction. Maybe you have less than you thought or maybe you have a lot more than you thought. So I think this could be very interesting. It could be, you know, that if you're working a case with level two and um, it's not related, they might ask you to collect this information because it might be interesting for them to, uh, to, to know that up front as they're doing initial diagnostics. But hopefully, it's really just for your information is what, what's going on from a SNOM perspective. Okay, and the least exciting topic in any of these tech update presentations, but it's always there, and we always have to talk about it, is functional removals. Because um, we've been around a long, long time as a product. Uh, the comm server's been around since the mid-90s, and of course, it was comprised of uh, VTAM and TCPIP, and they've been around even before that. So we have a lot of baggage, if you'd like to call it that. And over time, we do have to deprecate some older functions. There are two things primarily that were, were, are being removed in 3.1, and both of these were SOD, statements of directions were issued. And we're going to look at those statements of direction on the next two charts. So first of all, and probably less likely to affect you, but very important that you understand whether it does, is this one. It says withdrawal of support for VTAM link station architecture, LSA, and TCPIP LAN channel station, LCS devices. Okay, so a lot of words in that yellow box. This is the statement of direction that was issued roughly two years ago. It was issued with the availability announcement for ZOS V2R5. Um, I'll just try to summarize. It started really with a, a statement of direction from the hardware team where they said that a future hardware deliverable would no longer support OS, OSC chipped, the chip ID type. Uh, the OSC chipped is what gives you native SNA Ethernet access. Um, today, most of you, your enterprise, your SNA traffic is going over enterprise extender. And so it, it's a logical link over whatever IP connectivity you have. But if you're using native SNA Ethernet, that's through this LSA device type. And so with the hardware team saying OSC is going away, we decided to, to issue a statement of direction that said 2.5 would be the last release to support LSA and uh, LCS for that for that matter. And so, so if you're using those things, when you go to 3.1, you'll have to be using a different form of technology here. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, I point out that we do provide a migration health check to help you identify if you have any LSA devices in use. Uh, that health check has been available for quite a while now on um, 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5. Uh, my comment about this chart is that I expect that to affect very few of you, especially in the United States, there's not a lot of this around. There is more of, in certain other geog geographies such as Asia Pacific. Um, it is imperative in my mind that you understand whether this affects you. Um, some of you may know right off the bat, you don't use this, and all of your SNAP traffic's over EE and maybe MPC plus or something like that. If you don't know, please, please, please find out now when you go upgrade to 3.1, is not the time to find it out because if you're using LSA on any significant scale, uh, moving off of it may take a, a fairly significant amount of effort. So this is something you want to know ahead of time. The second one um, might affect, might apply to more of you, but it's also a little easier to deal with, and that's the removal of OSA device link home configuration support. This was issued to, about two years ago as well. And what it's telling you is that 2.5 is the last release that will support device link and home configuration of OSA connectivity. Now, that doesn't say we're getting rid of device link and home. You still need those for configuration of static VIPAs and maybe some other things, but you will not be able to use it in 3.1 for OSA. If you're configuration, configuration your OSA connectivity in 3.1, you must use the interface statement. The interface statement's been around for about two decades now. We introduced it with our initial IPv6 deliverable way back in ZOS V1R4, 
And from that point forward, we kept telling people, this is the future. Because in every parameter that we added, things like virtual max and so forth, we put it on the interface statement, but you couldn't use it with the device link at home. We were basically foreshadowing that this event was coming. Well, now it's here in 3.1. You must use the interface statement for your OSA connectivity. Uh, again, if you look at the bullets below the yellow box, there is a migration help check that you can, that'll help you figure this out. You probably already know. Uh, you can certainly browse your TCP IP profile and figure it out pretty quickly, but the migration help check will, will, will help you. And then I also point out that there's a bullet in the communication server IP configuration guide that tells you a little bit about how to do this migration. So depending on the amount of host of connectivity you have and device link and home statements, you know, that will, will determine how big of an effort this is. Another thing it's probably nice to get in front of now rather than waiting till you're uh, have installed 3.1 and are ready to IPL, IPL it for the first time. There are some other statements, are also some removal information in the appendix. I'm not going to cover that. Um, those are things that were removed in 2.5. So if you're still at 2.4 or even 2.3, and you're planning an upgrade to 3.1, jumping over 2.5, you need to be aware of those as well. Again, most of them don't affect many people. There is one that can and very often will, and that's the support of native TLS for the FTP server, uh, the TN3270 and DCAS. So you do need to read about those if you're at 2.3 or 2.4, planning to jump to, well, 2.5 or 3.1. But again, we won't cover that there, but it is in the appendix. Uh, just a really brief look at a couple of other comm server deliveries that were happened during the last two years. They were delivered uh, via continuous delivery, so straight to 2.4 and 2.5 in the case of this. This is support for SMF compliance evidence. Uh, the compliance evidence initiative was broader than comm server. It was across the OS and covered a lot of things. From a comm server perspective, it means that we generate new SMF type 1154 records they provide compliance evidence for the stack, for the FTP daemon, for our telnet server, and for our mail client, CSSMTP. Um, so if you have that main, the maintenance noted there, um, you will now have that those SMF records give you um, some evidence of compliance. There's also, I'm going to talk about the new function APAR summary pages in a minute, and you can get more information from those. Um, another delivery across the last couple years was we talked about ZNA. We provided um, passphrase support and password management support. The thing here is that uh, ZNA used to only support eight-character passwords, and beginning with the maintenance you see here, delivered on two, three, four, and five, um, you have up to 100-character passphrase supported. We also provided an enhancement to allow you to clear the um, database credentials by basically pressing a button uh, to enable easier switching between database user IDs. And again, there's maintenance there you'll note that you need for this, and you can look at the new function APAR summary pages if you need more information. I can probably, should probably remove this chart or these next two charts because most of you are probably aware of this now, but for one last time, here it is, the IBM Ideas portal. We mark migrated to IDEA about one year ago, just slightly over a year ago. Um, ComServe was actually the first ZOS element to use the old RFE system, which some of you remember. We went to that almost a decade ago. And RFE was game-changing at the time because it allowed customers to directly input requirements and vote on requirements and communicate with us when we didn't understand what you were asking for. We could go back to you easily and get that information. Ideas is really the same thing. It's a different front end, a different tool, tool that you use, but it gives you the same capabilities, really. And um, there's a link at the bottom of the page that will take you directly to the ZOS uh, Ideas portal. And it looks kind of like this. In this case, I, I've gone over to the left side, and you can't see it, but I scroll down and click Selected Communication Server, and I get something like you see on this screen. And so you, these are a bunch of requirements, or ideas as they're now called. You see the title, you see a description, and most importantly, you see the number of votes that requirement has, and you can click on the vote to say you think that's important too. Um, just It's kind of an idea there. The third one in the list you see is ZERT, Unnecessary Migration Trouble from 2.3 to 2.4 to 2.5. That's the, one of the topics I talked about early in the presentation was the, how, how it's been kind of a bit of work to upgrade the ZNA on a new release. Um, at the time I captured this, a number of customers had voted for that, and as you saw, we have addressed it now, or we will have addressed it uh, in 3.1, sorry. Now, 
Most of you probably know this. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but we, for several releases now, have had these new function APAR summary web pages where we maintain for each release a list of the new functions that are available to, to get via PTF. Uh, for each um, item that we've shipped, we include a summary of the function, a link to the APAR, and a link to the function documentation. So I show you the URL for 2.4 and the URL for 2.5, whichever one of those please go to that link and bookmark it because it's really useful because now when you go to this page, it shows you all the stuff, that I, a lot of the stuff I've talked about through this presentation are things I said, well, we've rolled this back. It's available in 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, whatever. Now you can find out what we've done. You might find out there's some, some things available you weren't aware of. Uh, so like here's the entry for that FTP server just access control. That was the first item I talked about in the presentation. And you see that we did make it available on uh, 2.5 in March of 2022, because this is the 2.5 page. It describes it briefly as a link to the APAR, as a link to the documentation for the function, it'll list dependencies, and so forth. So this is kind of like one-stop shopping for a new function that we've delivered via continuous delivery. So again, highly recommended. Um, in a few months, they'll, uh, a 3.1 version of this will appear since we have maintenance to deliver on 3.1. Another quick advertisement is for a white paper on OSA Express best practices. Um, one of my, my colleague, uh, Jerry Stevens, he's our device driver architect, um, and he wrote this paper uh, probably about a year or so ago just to capture some guidance on uh, configuring OSA Express. Uh, there's an easy link there to get to. It's not a long paper. It's probably a six pages or so of real meat, um, so you can go through it fairly quickly, but um, there's a lot of good information and a lot of good suggestions there, so it's, it's worth your time to take a look at that if you haven't already. Another paper you might want to look at is our Communication Server Performance Summary Report. We do these one of these for every release. Typically, they come out about six months or so after the release became generally available. So um, 2.5 became available a little under two years ago, and the following spring or so, we issued this performance summary report. And it's, it's a, just a lot of information about um, common server performance, about all kinds of things as far as a number of connections, encryption costs, and so forth. You'll probably find it very interesting. Um, you might say, well, this is, we're talking about 3.1 here. Where's the 3.1 server, um, common server performance summary report? And that would be um, issued sometime next year. When 3.1 GA is later this year, it'll take us uh, another six months or so to wrap all our, our uh, testing up and give you a, um, a nice summary that we'll put out there. That link at the bottom of the page is a link to all of the um, performance summary reports that we've done, it, and it, of course, will be added to the list at that time. Um, education in the mainframe area is, is not exactly plentiful. And over the last few years, our um, information development team has worked really hard to try to get some uh, coursework out there to learn about um, comms, mainframe and mainframe networking. And you know, if you have newer people in your organization, this is really useful. You can see five different topics here where you take courses and you can earn badges, which you can display to say you, you've learned all this material. Uh, we've gotten really good feedback on the, the value and usefulness of these, so check them out if you aren't already familiar with them and haven't already looked into them. The IBM community, there's a link there. Uh, this is you, you go here and you'll see a whole lot of blog entries and other information on various topics. Um, like you see, here, for example, an event calendar that you can click on and get the um, like information about shares or the IBM Tech Exchange or whatever my coming event might be out there. Um, as well as just all, all types of other blog entries about various things. So this is where you might go to learn some things about the latest uh, security topics, uh, latest things related to ZERT or ZNA, and so forth. So a good link to bookmark and check every now and then. And that does it. That's the end of our presentation. I'm going to just one last time point out that the PDF for this presentation is available on site SlideShare. If you didn't write down that URL before, you can take the time to do it now. Having said that, we, we thank all of you for attending. I hope it's been worthwhile that you've learned something and get you excited about what you can get at or some of the stuff that we get delivered in the last two years you can have now. Otherwise, um, I'll wrap up and thank you again for joining us today.